A short program that's been put together on behalf of the Embassy of God in Kiev, Ukraine. And you know what I have in the studio here with me? Uh, the man of God himself, the senior pastor of the church, Pastor Sunday Adelaja. And remember, the church is the largest in Europe. And as we proceed with this program, you'll be learning a lot as to how the church came to be a dominant force here in the Ukraine and even in Europe, where a young man just rose from nowhere and shocked the whole world. So stand by to learn a few things that will bless you. If your pastor is not watching, I want to encourage you to call him right now and tell him that he's about to see something that will bless him, transform his ministry to the glory of God's name. But before I proceed, I want to read a letter, a letter that was actually sent. Remember, the man of God has faced a lot of persecution in this nation because of the nature of the work. Because like Christ said in the Bible, he said, when you stand for righteousness, they will hate you. They will persecute you just the same way they persecute me. So he went through it. But by the grace of God, according to him, the people who persecuted him under the previous regime are now under investigation, and they themselves have to be reporting to the police station every week. But listen, I'm going to read a letter to you now, which came from the current president of the Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych. It says, Letter of Gratitude, Sunday Adelaja. I would like to thank you sincerely for your active participation in the presidential campaign 2010. Your selfless labor, high sense of duty, and civic, civic stand shown in such difficult circumstances of political opposition have become the main guarantee of our common victory. I appreciate your support and assistance extremely high and hope for further collaboration in establishing Ukraine as a strong and prospering country for the Ukrainian people. I wish you health, prosperity, personal happiness, and new achievements for the welfare of the Ukrainian state. Signed, President of the Ukraine, Mr. V.F. Yanukovych. You know what? It was actually written in uh, Russian, but it's just it's been translated into English. So just bear with the grammar. God bless you. I'm here with the senior pastor himself to talk about some other, some other things entirely. And also with him is a wonderful lady and a sister in the Lord by the name Mrs. Victoria this is Victoria. Atunashi. Atunashi, sorry. You know, uh, just the name just skipped me there. Mrs. Victoria Atunashi, she's actually the managing director of a bookshop, Christian bookshop called The Rock. In fact, it's not bookshop, it's bookshop. <laughs> so she, she runs, she sells a lot of good Christian books in the Tower Bridge area and different parts of the world, especially on the internet. So, you know what? I want to encourage you to sit back and just watch. And I know you'll surely be blessed. God bless you. Welcome to the program, sir, and Sister Victoria. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you for coming to the Ukraine. Amen. It's good to be with you. We've been really, really blessed. And I, you know, we have just finished the retreat. And uh, we arrived actually on the final day of the convention. So we missed a few days. And some people were sharing with us how wonderful it was. The testimonies that came from people. Because, you know, <laughs> like somebody was saying the other day, when the church experiences even one drug addict give their life to Christ and transformed, it becomes the main testimony of that church for years to come. And some people said they were shocked to see hundreds coming forward from drug addiction, alcoholic uh, problems, prostitution, to go give testimonies on stage as to what God has done in their lives. And on that final day, we saw a guy, I think he was a drug addict, totally clean, and is running a business producing bags for companies. I saw Ferrari. I saw top companies. DHL. Uh, yes, I said, I DHL and all those guys. How did, was this guy able to come out of drug addiction and then come to a point where he's a top supplier to most, most of these major companies? Not going through deliverance for 20 days or 30 days of 1 million days. <laughs> and yet, he's effective. So what is the secret? What are you, have you been doing to these guys? You no, know, I'm almost embarrassed to even mention the kind of results we're having with healing, healing of cancer. For example, last year I just called somebody up to, for, to, to the stage 
who was testifying of being healed of cancer. So I said, oh, who else was healed of cancer? Two, two to 300 people came to the stage. You know, those are, miracles are just normal occurrences. Then drug addicts, I'm never embarrassed to say how many people have been delivered from addiction. Uh, in a, you know, I'm, even, I've, I'm just intimidated myself to say it because people will not believe. People are already skeptical about me and about the results that we have that it's, it's, it's beyond this world. It blows your mind. So if I go and tell you now that we have, we have 10,000 people set free from drug addiction, wouldn't you say you are just crazy? You know, people who are expecting one person, maybe two, maybe 20, and that will be over the board. Can, can I now come and say 10,000? I'm not saying 1,000. I'm not even saying 100. I'm not even saying 2,000. 10,000. No, it's like a big church. It's like a church on its own, set free from addiction. You know, so if I begin to mention that, nobody will build. They will just say, this guy is a genius. So I just keep quiet. I will not say anything, unless you come by yourself to say. Or if I say how many people, oh, women are with prostitutes, and I call how many people got set free from prostitution, and two hundred or three hundred women show up on the stage, nobody will believe that it is true. So I, the only thing I can do, the only argument I have is the video. I can only show, I can only call, but then they said, you set them up. So I don't even know what to say, unless you come to the Ukraine and you, be, you begin to see these things, it's beyond. That is why when I see people doing deliverance ministry, we don't have deliverance ministry in this church. We don't practice deliverance. That's serious. But people are getting delivered without sweat at all. And you know, we went to the drug rehabilitation center, the one you have close to this place today. We got there, we met a, a gentleman who is in charge. Apparently he himself was a drug addict before and now clean and running the center. <laughs> and he told us a story about a top official of the government of this country in charge of drug addiction and all those things, who was invited to come and see the work there. Mm -hmm. And he said when he came, he said he, the man was skeptic. And the man was thinking to himself that, well, these guys, they probably just spruce up the whole place and just put some guys there to tell him all the right things to, to say that they're doing a good job, just to impress him. So he came and he stood there and, he, and, he, and then the, one of the leaders were telling him what the center was doing. And he said the next thing, this top, um, lead, this top man, top official, government, yeah, government, government official, of turned around and said, listen, don't tell me about what you're doing and the result and everything. I want to meet these people one to one so I can ask them questions <laughs> myself to know. And the thinking behind his mind was that if they are exposed, if they've been, if they've been arranged, arranged for him to, to meet him, they will be exposed. So he went and he went and met all these guys. And whilst he was greeting one of them, the other one turned around and greeted him as a command, as a general. He said, you know, good afternoon, general. He said, How do you know I'm a general? Because I'm in suit. The guy said, I knew you when you were in charge of the district where I used to be before. Masha Kalara, baka, baba, so you were the general in charge of this uh, drug addiction and uh, narcotics. Masha and he used to Kalara, make life difficult for us. I said, are you sure? Nishin and in order for baby. this top official to know that the guy was real, he said, now tell me the places in the area where they used to deal in drugs, where we used to go and you know, arrest you guys. And the guy mentioned all the key areas. He said the guy was, the, the top official was shocked. He said, that's when he, he now mellowed and he started <laughs> talking to them proper. And he said, So, how you know what brought you? How did, how did you, what's happened here? And the guy started explaining this kind of treatment he got there. And even from the man in charge of the center, he shared something with us. He said, When a lot, some of them come around, they're very aggressive. They don't, they're not prepared to follow orders. They're not prepared to do anything. They just want to do their own thing. So, normally, the natural reaction is to try and force them to do it. He said, But we don't. We don't force them. He said, what we do is that we show them love, walk with them and encourage them and say, listen, you are here to transform your life. The family members are sitting waiting for you and everything. And by the time you know it through love, they are broken and they're totally transformed. And it was, it was unbelievable. Love. Love is the key. That's what Jesus brought. Mm -hmm. He didn't bring demons. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, apparently, according to statistical figures, they said this general, this so-called general who was in suit, now civilian suit, he, he just believed in going around and arresting all those guys, and he wants to go and put them on an island somewhere because they discovered that statistically, 50% of crimes committed were committed by drug addicts. Yes. And they said they discovered also, statistically, 
that one drug addict within a year commits over 200 crimes. Wow. So to him, he was fed up and he thought, all we need to do is grab these guys, lock them up on an island and just, you know, forget about, forget about them. <laughs> so coming here and seeing these guys transformed was shocking. And not just becoming normal people who come to church, but in the next six years, they become leaders. I mean, the next six months, six months, yeah. they become leaders. In the next one year, they start their own businesses or they go and get a job for family. Then in the next one year, they become leaders of rehabilitation centers themselves or pastors or ministers or businessmen. The guy you are talking about who is working with DHL and Ferrari, he's a millionaire. He said, there are two drug addicts who came, they were li living in the streets or out in the street. His own father was a drug addict too. He was born in the family of drug addicts, you know, lost totally in the street. Now they are millionaires in their own class. So, and they are million, they are, well, at least we have 20 millionaires who are coming out of drug addicts in the last five years. Okay. So, who have become millionaires today. So, uh, and not that we don't believe in deliverance, we do believe in deliverance, but those are the elementary, the very surface scratching, the very tip of the iceberg, the, the very least thing you could do, the kingdom offers. These are just the benefits, these are the sideways benefits, these are just. The the thing that the natural consequences of the gospel of the kingdom. Hmm. Well, those are not the things you focus on, you zero on, and you begin to make it your own ministry. You know, those are just things that will follow you. You don't follow things like that. He said, This sign shall follow them that believe. They follow you, you don't follow them. What do you follow then? You pursue the kingdom. He said, You are only supposed to seek after one thing. Seek after the kingdom and its righteousness. What does that mean? Seek to know the king. Seek to be like the king. Seek to inculcate the character and the lifestyle of the king into you. Seek to reflect and live his life. Seek to be his image on the earth. Oh, seek that you become a reflection of his feelings. The realization of the dream of God on the earth. So you just need to appear and people don't need to doubt that there is God at all. Because they see you, they see his love. They see his nature. And you just convince them that, ah, there is something beyond a man here. This is a man that carries God himself. So that is what we are supposed to dedicate ourselves seeking in getting involved in, 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 in you know, establishing ourselves in his personality, making sure that he is reflected in us. Thereby, we become a God carrier ourselves. So when you become a God carrier, will you be easy? The demons themselves are running away. All those demons, all the demons that because drug addiction, they are demon possession. You know, I don't even spend a minute on one of them. Just one word. When you are already God addicted, when you are God carrier, you don't even need to spend you know, five minutes with demons. Some people, some people are telling me stories all night of you know for generation calls, generation whatever this and demons and. That is not the goal. Forget about that one. Get, get yourself filled with God and see what will happen to generation cause. Wow. <laughs> get yourself filled with God, my friend. And those things will just be happening on their own just as consequences. God bless you, sir. You know, I read uh, one of your books, Hearing from God, How to Hear from God. And you were putting some scriptures there. And the scripture that kept reoccurring which is in line with what you just explained now, was that he said Jesus Christ went about teaching the people in the synagogues. He, he, he taught every time he taught, telling them about the kingdom, then after that he healed them. Yes. Several scriptures, I kept on seeing the same theme. He went in the synagogue, he taught about the kingdom, and then healed them. Yes. And it was just all the way through. And that's exactly what I'm seeing in, you know, in the church. The church is for equipping. What you do in the church, you, when you study the pattern of the ministry of Jesus Christ, in the church, he never preached deliverance. No, no, no. Deliverances occurred in the church, but he didn't preach it. Healings occurred in the church, but he never preached it. What he did in the church was that he taught. The church is about teaching believers the lifestyle of the kingdom of God, the nature of God, and how to advance the purposes of God. That is what he taught, taught in the synagogue. But when at the end of the day, after teaching them to know the nature of God, he now demonstrated the power of the kingdom, of that kingdom, by exercising dominion over demons, over sicknesses, over death, over nature. 
But those things he demonstrated to take the attention of unbelievers to prove to them the superiority of God. But as soon as they become believers, he begins to train them again in synagogue. So that's why 90% of all the miracles of Jesus didn't happen in the synagogue or in the church. They happen in the streets. Go and study your Bible. 90% of all the miracles of Jesus, they happen in the streets. Not just of Jesus and the disciples as well in the eyes of the others. Why? Miracles, signs, and wonders are not for believers. He says signs are for the unbelievers. That's what he says in Corinthians. Wow. <laughs> so miracles, supernatural, that's why evangelists carry those grace, that grace. Because evangelists are supposed to go to the field and demonstrate the power of God. But as soon as you bring them to the church, you are supposed to establish them by teaching them the nature of God. So that they will become the image of God. So that they will reflect God now. And that becomes the mission of the believer. To now carry God to his own segment. An area of calling. But if you are filled with God. Healing is a natural occurrence. Like for example we are doing a stone laying ceremony. Um, on Sunday. In the last day of the conference. In the morning. And while we were doing the stone laying, there was a woman there in, on, in wheelchair, on wheelchair. I saw that one. Okay, you saw the video. I don't yeah. know if so. I saw you that know, one. They had to. And she had not worked in 10 years on her own. In 10 years by herself, she had not worked. I didn't even know she was there. I didn't even see her at all. We were just busy doing the you know, ceremony, the stone laying ceremony. And, you know, we just walked by her. By the time we finished laying this something, all the sicknesses were getting healed and she just got up 10 years she had not worked she just got up and began to walk and she was surprised herself even here at the retreat one or yesterday or two days ago i don't know was it yesterday. what was what, what was the testimony we didn't even she, she couldn't see but yeah. at the end of the previous night she realized she could see properly she had not seen for 10 years and we didn't even did we talk about healing or anything yeah. When you are filled with, when you are concerned with God and God alone, then you are not using all these gimmicks, gimmicks, gimmicks to, you know, mass mesmerize people and take their money and rob them and, you know, put them under your own bondage as if you are the healing, you know, healer and the, you know, <laughs> deliverer that has come to town. You are the hero. And then you are telling stories instead of reading the Bible. <laughs> God bless what you. happened to you in your village, your grandmother, when I went to Spain and to Italy? Are you the only one who went there? <laughs> <laughs> if I'm going to be telling individual stories, eh? the whole, you know, my lifetime is not enough. Just to tell individual stories of the testimonies that I hear. Seriously. Individual stories, lifetime is not enough. If you are going to be using your faith to do individual healing of leg and something, that is our healing by the hundreds every day. Of demons that are coming out by the thousands every day. You want to use your life to spend on that one instead of using your faith and your life to subdue nations. God bless you, sir. And wow. change culture. Wow. But we were really, really, we've been really blessed because I came for the retreat, the three day retreat, and it was a life changing experience. But I have Sister um, Victoria here today, and I know she was part of the retreat as well. And I know, the, I, I just needed to ask you, first of all, when the retreat started, looking back at the retreat now, what was shocking to you from the retreat? To be honest with you, uh, my concept of retreat is not what I meant. I was thinking it's going to be a prayer, you know, somebody leading and telling us to go away, then come back, reflect on what the Lord is saying, start all over. But when I saw a lot of people, and to my amazement, when I saw people coming, people all the way from Russia, uh, from um, China, that yeah. was China, first of all what blew my Sakhalin mind. Island in Russia. That you've come for a three days retreat just to pray. Okay? Traveling about seventeen hours. So I was really, really, what can I say? I was expectant to see what will happen. So are we going to go out into the field, or what are we going to do? Prayer warrior. <laughs> So, but when I saw everybody with the pen and paper, even no Bible, I said, okay, where am I going from this? <laughs> and now to be taught in the biblical way that the retreat that we used to know is not the same that we're going to, you know, experience for the three days. So I decided to hold on to my gear to say, yes, Lord, I'm ready. Whatever it is, 
So, but when we started, I thank God the way the man of God actually explained to us, to enlighten us that what we're about to see is actually, it's not going to use the Bible, but everything we're going to learn today is what we're commanded to do as a believer. But because we've been following our own agenda, that's why we're not seeing results. But if we're kingdom-minded, the church of God will not be what it is today. We're laboring to actually think the church is not being filled, but we're doing it the wrong way because we're actually following our own agenda, thinking that that can actually get the anointing or the blessing of God because we're not doing it the way of God. And it started with the telling us what is our goal as a believer, what is our goal, and what is the agenda of God. So that was where I started thinking that this is real. Then when it started with the goal in mind, telling us, the, am I, okay, what is my goal? What do I want to achieve? As a born, being born again Christian, what is, actually, what is the first mission? What is the purpose of my being born again? Is it for me to satisfy my own self or to be mindful of what God intention for the old nation? Then it started with the goal principle. The goal principle it illustrated that first of all, our goal is to win 10,000. Then how do we carry out that goal? Is by having a structural plan. And that was what was mind blowing. Because how can you win the soul of 10,000 in a year? And I did being, we were not in his church on Sunday, I would say, well, he's lying. So I'm sorry to say that. But because I've seen it myself, the, the amount of people in a tent and the joy, not that they were only there, but they were manifesting. Because at the end of the program, I saw what he taught us. And you know, in manifestation. manifestation in the church, because when I saw all those people that he referred to earlier on, they were coming out, even the man, all the carrier bags, I thought what was, you know, because we were, you know, being aided by the interpreter, and was saying that was actually that man's ministry. When he got born again from being a drug addict, and all of a sudden his life was transformed. And I think it's based on the principle of this teaching, because it tells them what they need to do, and this is what church is all about. So in the goal, we started with the goal teaching. With the goal, it, decide, it taught us how we have to have a structural plan in place. Having identified what our goal is, that is to win so, then we have to put the proper plan. And that plan is where the process starts from. That you cannot build a house without a proper foundation, or else the house will collapse. So it started by telling us, explaining to us, precept upon precept, line upon line that we identify what, what am I going to do with this goal? How can I achieve it? First of all, we put the time space. Because if we don't have a time to achieve a goal, we will forever be on that goal. And we can never complete it. It's an assignment, but we have to allot a time. That, OK, I'm winning 10,000. Then how do I win 10,000 in a year? It's by setting a time. A, my goal is to win 10,000. But the time scale that I've got, this is it. So we're given a year. So I was still holding on to, how can you realize that 10,000? Within a year, it's not possible. It took us to another level. That was where I started seeing that it's possible. It's only where I was there with place limitation that it can never be done. It started with the plan. Then how do I get these people? Where do I get them from? How can I get, where are they? Where are they based? Then it started with the second plan. 